Hi, everybody. Uh, hopefully you could hear me online. It's not let, let me know. Um, so we're in a very interesting time in the world where you probably realize that you cannot avoid discussions about, about AI. So I'm going to talk through some of those. Um, I've been doing um, AI work for over 20 years. And I, I was uh, um, at Stanford and then in Silicon Valley where we did a lot of AI stuff. And then almost 20 years ago, I came up to this school and I found it with, with Tekla and, and other people as well. And we're continuing on. I teach the, the graduate AI class here and I think some of you are in it. So you're gonna see a little bit of duplication on some things. Um, so anyway, uh, that's that's a bit of my background, I guess, from the AI side. The other thing is um, I was at Electronic Arts and then, then went back into research at Stanford and I got a call from kind of EA Maxis to do the to put to do the face system for the Sims. And uh, and that was one of the first uh, examples of artificial intelligence in what we call a triple A game. Um, Time passes, so at some point people don't know what the Sims are. But it was the best-selling game of 2002. Okay, so um, that's a little bit about me. Uh, I have a lab here, and uh, I come from a kind of a, a cognitive science background to so how the brain works, and thinking about how to model that. Uh, at the same time, I just always had this this artist career. I used to have to separate them into two different resumes and all that kind of thing. Somewhere around Stanford, so that was like 20 years ago, it seemed like it was okay to put them back together. And then I found out that there was, we were starting a new school somewhere up in Vancouver that was really good to put them together. And here we are. Um, okay, so uh, just quickly, my, my, my lab looks at modeling the human, you know, um, and we use uh, AI and, and cognition to do that. Obviously, there's many ways you could model a human about how they move and how they walk and, and, and medically in this. But we're mainly looking at these areas that a lot of people don't take on, like expression, emotion, gesture, personality, behavior, and a lot of creativity. Sometimes the way we do that is with a lot of biosensing, you know, because if you want to you get the computer to know about you, it's, it's not just about what you type in, it's how, how you are, how you move, how you breathe, all that. So we use sensors as well. Um, so that's this cognitive science mm -hmm. approach, you know, moving from what we call communication systems, just text and visuals, the full kind of uh, expression technologies is, is one thing that I'm interested in. It usually means that, the, that I'm interested from input of, of the voice, literally the stress in your voice, uh, and other things, movement, intent, emotions. And you can do that with sensor systems. There's this mid-level computational part, which is a lot of this AI. And then that usually outputs in, in different kinds of ways as well to VR, they are in 360. Uh, I mentioned that I have an AI lab that, that's got a lot of uh, students in it. I'm proud to say that it's 76% women, mostly PhDs, surely women AI researchers bring a different perspective and for my thing they do very well and we win we win research and uh and things with that perspective so it's it's great to be able to to do that i should mention um we're at a school that at the undergraduate level is is i think 55 percent female which is a little bit unheard of for a technology school uh other schools are around 20%, like pure computer science schools, 20 would be considered good. We also have a female director and, and a lot of other things. So that that, that kind of, and we're talking about AI, we're also talking about a lot of bias issues and it's really good to get the, the wider perspective in. And when I'm talking about, I do a lot of collaborations, so a lot of things I'm gonna show you are actually collaborations with, with, with folks here, in, including in the case of this, this colloquium that I'm in, but Kate, I work a lot with Kate Hennessy and, and Reese as well, too. So you'll see some of that. Okay, so um realize I'm gonna have to. I think every once time someone comes in, I think it's this way. Um, I'm gonna keep trying to hit this high floating menu. There we go. Okay, so obviously AI is all over the news now. Um, 
I, it's kind of annoying for us. We've been doing this for years because it's just kind of gone crazy. Um, so it's exploding. So I, I, I don't have those in my slides, but we've been doing AI for 50 years. And everyone thinks, oh my God, this is amazing. This is the greatest thing. And then it fails. And then we call that an AI winter. So that happened in the 50s. It happened in the 70s. And, and we are, and, and happened somewhat recently until generally these, a lot of more of these, these, these three Canadians was using one type of AI, this machine learning, deep learning technique that has really hit in rather significant ways. And uh, that's been, and even that they're thinking, oh, it's slowing down. And then you might know with things like chat GPT and, and some of these visual systems that they've really taken off. I've been doing a lot of uh, TV interviews and talks like this to try and explain what's going on. I honestly feel like I'm losing that, that the, the, the wave of social media misconception is just, is just way over my head and I'll just mention that in a second. Okay, so that's what I've written here, that there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, and there's a lot of this, do we have super smart AGI now? So when I say AGI, I mean, uh, that's a term that's a general artificial intelligence. So that's, that would be intelligent about everything as opposed to other kinds of AI that would be specific. I wrote an AI program that can do some form of music. I wrote an AI program that could handle x-rays, right? But this, this general AI is now in the conversation. It's funny that it is because I'll show you that the systems that we're currently using are not AGI systems. My lab goes to both these AGI conferences and these deep learning or machine learning conferences. And the deep learning, machine learning ones are really more of a statistical, kind of dead learning kind of system that we'll talk about that isn't this other one. That what's going on with real AGI? Well, those conferences are there. Um, they're not moving. It's still a hard problem and they're still working through it. So it, it's, it's funny to be in both. But again, when we talk about misconceptions, people think this other method, this deep learning method that is really taking off is in fact now the whole thing. And it, it, it probably really isn't. So the real issues, and one of the things I'm here to say is I'm not sure what we're discussing the real issues, and I want to make sure we do. Um, the only way to answer that is to know, which is what this talk is, a deep dive on what AI is. So for, for people who've taken my AI class, but for everyone in the room, I will go a little technical, just so you know, hey, this is all it is. If it's this, now we could talk about the ethical issues, as opposed to it's some entity out there. So two issues of the day based on these, when I say ML, I mean machine learning. I'll, I'll discuss the difference between machine learning and, and um, deep learning um, is obviously words and visuals. So how many people, um, I can't see everybody online, but at least in, in the audience, has, has, has tried chat GPT or any of the GPT systems? And they, they're really, it's really taken off. It's, it's now daily, almost flipping. So there was this notion that, oh my God, Google's behind. They really messed up because Microsoft has this chat GPT. Officially, Microsoft kind of had nothing and bought or, or licensed chat GPT from an, this open AI. And, uh, and then, and I was, and then you, maybe you saw that Google tried to bring up their, it's now out again called BARD system that came out and it kind of, failed or didn't do well. And then that was the press. Microsoft is the AI champs and who knows what Google is anymore. And then it only took a week for those stories to flip because people started using things AI and it was getting nasty and strange. And they're going, oh, Google maybe was smart for not bringing up there's too early, it was micro. So we really have this back and forth going on. So let's talk about those two. First of all, I want to make sure we define them. So I'm not going to use the chat GPT name I'm going to use the technical one, which is, it's a large language model. So a large language model would be GPT-2, GPT-3, and GPT-4 just came out. Chat GPT is just a version of GPT-3 that does conversation and some lookup well, and we'll talk about that. Um, and, you know, and, that's, and this bar is coming out from Google. So that's an LLM. So when, when you, I'll just start using that term LLM. So the New York Times, so maybe I'll just see what the other one is. The other one is the visual systems that are going crazy. We have two papers that we, we've just done on, on the explosion that's going on on this side as well. So sometimes they refer to as AI art system. 
technical name is diffusion, so I'll call them diffusion systems, but that's like stable diffusion, mid-journey, Dali. And then these very commercial versions like Lenza. How many people have played with any one of those systems, like use Lenza or stable diffusion? So not as many as ChatGPT. Okay, so pretty recently, and this got around, the New York, a New York Times writer, a well-known writer said, I, I had this conversation with Bing's chatbot and it let me deeply unsettled. So, wow, that sounds like a real issue. And then this issue on the other side is artists are suing over stable diffusion, which is one of the systems for stealing artwork. So these would be two kind of big ethical discussions of the day. And I actually think they're both kind of dead wrong, which is funny. This New York Times guy has already recanted because he kind of overdid it and said, you know, it isn't that bad. It's like, of course. So one of the things that happened is it got ugly, which is what happens. You said, oh, how, what are you and what do you want to do? And eventually the AI, you know, went exactly the way that we have feared that AI will go. You know, I'm, I want to take over and hit you on the head or whatever it is. Why did it do that? He had a complete misreading of why it did that. Um, similarly, I'm not sure this is the big art story. So these are the kinds of things that we, I'd like to get into a little bit. So let's just take those on right away. Um, in general, for either one of those systems, and these are deep learning based systems, there is no AI in that there's no entity that's out there making art or narratives or thinking or talking. There is only a computer science tool that uses this, that uh, humans have made obviously, that kind of cheaply uses a statistical technique which is in fact, all of deep learning is a type of statistical technique. I use, uh, what, the thing I used for the Sims was a very different kind of technique. That was a genetic evolutionary technique, which is more of a search space technique. I mean, these are, in the end of the day, we still have to use math and logic to write these things. So anyway, that's what they are. And all they do is this. They look at the history of human visuals in one case, or human narrative. Narrative is a weird world, I might say, the written word. And the written word would be every book. GP3 almost has every book in it. And uh, uh, in common crawl, so that's like every form. So all it is doing is statistically, in the case of LM, putting that together. So a much better way to say what you're doing, what you're doing when you use chat GPT, or when someone talks to it like the writer is, you're certain, you, you, it allows us to surf and stitch through the human history of, in the case of visuals, you know, uh, visual space, art, photography, and, and soon video, or the human history of the written word, which is like, which is like books, poems, scripts, forms. Kind of a neat tool to have, you know, that, that you could actually have a tool that you can search through space, and a lot of artists are using it in that way, where I, I don't just put in a prompt in those systems. I like to kind of move around, and I know that's what I'm doing, and I know I can go cubist and then move this way and that way, and it's a journey thing. So um, it turns out some people are kind of good at that, you know, giving these, they started to call them like AI whisperers, people who are just starting to be good at, at you know, at kind of manipulating this. But the first thing to be good at it is to realize there's no AI there at all. There's just, it, it, you're, it's a mirror of all of humanness. And as soon as you get that, and guess what? All of humanness is inherently biased, incorrect and everything else, which is why, you know, it didn't, so people, you know, some people on these uh, visual ones go, oh, I put in a mirror. So in the mirror, I would see what it looks like. It's like, no, what you would see is <laughs> whatever we've talked about visually about what's on the other side of a mirror, it would, you would not see the AI. Similarly, if we're back to the New York Times writer, he couldn't believe it went negative. Oh my God, this story went everywhere. Wait a minute, this, this, this system is inherently evil. But of course, all it's doing is statistically, and it's literally like a gravity. If there's certain, if, if you're saying it in a certain way, it might go when it's trying to think of all. So basically all it's doing is saying, oh, you gave me words. I got to answer you with other words. Statistically, what would be the right words to put that would match the words you're asking me? Oh, okay. Well, there's a, it turns out the way you said it, it it's kind of a Bible passage. And because gravity wise of all the books in the world, there's so much talk about the Bible, I might head in that direction. 
And this is why occasionally it really messes up. Oh, that cover didn't know that. It's like, oh, because there was a commercial in the in the 1950s, whatever, in this in the 70s for Wendy's, where this old woman said, Where's the beef? And it turns out where's the beef didn't mean where's the actual beef anymore. It meant where's the important part of the thing you're saying. And you can imagine if you have a zillion people on on forum saying that, it's gonna pull in that direction. And this is why when it goes, oh, it's wrong and hallucinating, what it's actually doing is just kind of going, well, this is my best guess of, of the mess of this huge data set. So, okay, in the case of the New York Times writer, and I don't know if some of you remember the Google one, which is even more significant. So Google has a very large AI ethics group, very smart people there. Somewhere in the middle of that is just a QA tester. This guy was just like, okay, I, I should just look for words that are coarse or saying racist things and if I see them so low level. But he was a bit religious himself, but he kept asking the AI about soul. And that's when he ran out of Google, so to speak, if I could do the more, if people know the Soylent Green is people movie in the very end. And so now the Soylent Green is people, this thing you're eating people. So he kind of ran out of Google saying, oh my God, it's alive, it's alive. And it, it was so, and the New York Times, the Guardian, all picked it up. And of course, what's going to happen, given what I just told you, if, an, if you start talking with AI about an AI? Well, it would be the history of every movie, book, sci-fi short story about AI. Tell me any of them that don't want to take over and hit you over the head. So in fact, all he was doing, the AI, when answering back, was just reciting or stitching, as I like to say, the phobia, the narrative phobias of what we thought about AI ever. So it's a really interesting cycle. We're going, oh no, we're testing these new systems. And just like we thought, it's like, yeah, because that's what it's doing. It's, like, it's everything you thought you wrote down, and now it's it's just spitting it all back to you. So these are things to think about with this gravity pull of a training set. So I'll talk a little bit more about a training set, but right now I just told you in the case of this word system, the training set is every book and something called common crawl. So common books weren't enough. They needed to make this huge. So they put they use common crawl, which I tend to think the problem. And common crawl is just the way to get everything off the internet. So that would be Reddit, every Reddit forum. And so if there's a Reddit forum, you know, that uh, God is Picasso and everyone's talking about that band because it's the name of a band, all of a sudden, when you talk about God and Picasso, you're going, well, that's weird and hallucinated to that. So I think one of the problems is steering away from books just because you need more data and taking the mess of the data that's the internet. Well, you're going in every direction, you know, you just made a mess. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Um, I am interested in this live group and, and questions online what you think the biggest ethical issues are, and maybe we can discuss them knowing what we did. I'll quickly mention them here as we get into it. So again, the diffusion systems, it turns out I think they're great ideation systems for designers and artists. So disruption, so remember, I should have said, I'd like to bring up some things about AI for social good, how it's disruptive, good and bad ethics, and how it works. So I've now started that. This is a little bit on the disruption side because the jobs that you're going out to are going to be very different. And obviously there's a lot of worry that all jobs are going away because these are so smart. I'm trying to calm you down. No, this isn't an AGI system. This is a cheap mimicker of, of words and art. So we're not fully there, but they are getting better. But already one thing that seems to be amazing is how well you can ideate um, in this space. So if you're using mid-journey or stable diffusion, and you're, you come up with an idea, you could just move through that idea so well. And if you're doing it for a client, you could come up with something that's quite good. Is it finished? I, I think a real designer and artist doesn't care. It's finished, so it's just a good idea. And then I'll, I could realize it in any way I want to. Maybe I'll even realize it with other AI. But the notion of, of speed of sketching, so to speak, is wild because you have every, every uh, image and feeling uh, uh, in all photography and all art, married to the one that about diffusion systems. So we know LLM systems are a word space, and then we're used to it as a conversational chat. Just so, and diffusion, I claim, is this middle space. 
but actually the visual space is only half of it. The other half of it is giving it text props. So it turns out that the fusion has both this and that in it. And it, it was trained on what we call text image pairs. So it's just like, you know, there's a cat drinking milk and then a picture of a cat drinking milk. And that's what's in the system. So it's the, the amazing thing about this visual space is it's got concept in it because the concept is coming from the history of, 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 of the word system. Imagine describing every image there possibly is. Okay, so I think every design firm will start using this, but, but I think the one thing that I want everyone to realize is the current systems, it's like year one, right? So what they did, because they didn't know what else to do, is they made the biggest training set of everything. So GPT-2 was kind of working that well, and they could go, we could make it better, or we can just make the training really, really big. And that's what they did. So it, it, they stopped it with everything, Imagine if you were a design firm, any kind, let's say a car design firm, and you, instead of using this big, dumb one, thought of the history, because right now, what's going to be in there? Oh, that's a Porsche driving down the road. That will be the text under it, and that will be the picture. Better than that is how people would feel about a Porsche, right? And that's and same thing with design objects, right? So you can imagine this, this Danish Bauhaus design company thinking, of what would be the history of the design objects we've made, what people have talked about it and their feelings. So if you then created your own, and we're now starting to be able to do this, sometimes on top of the big one, you could put a, you could put your own. Um, then I think this will both of these will start taking off. What we have now is the massive everything dumb one that we're all stunned that we're getting good things out of, which is good, but at some point we're gonna realize, wait a minute. I have a brain and my company does. Why don't we start thinking about the IP of the history of the things we make and you know get that? And then we'll have that. Like no one will have that except for us. And I think that's where the design firms will go. And again, I'm being very wide with that word design firms will kind of really have this huge advantage. If you come work for mine, you will have, and you know me, I I, you know. I sketched the original Porsche and now we have these others and things like that. Well, you're not gonna get, not only are you gonna get mentorship from me, all of my brain and thing with the history of this is now in the system that you would contribute to and continue to work on. So rightly or wrongly, I think that's gonna be a, a, a kind of a big area. And if you're, if you're deciding if it's a good or not good now, we have the brute force corporate only huge system dump and we still think we're getting some reasons to have it. The stealing from artists one um, is a really complicated one. I might leave that and we'll talk about it later. Okay, so um, the, the LMS already seems to be a great way to do research and put your thoughts in prose. So is it plagiarism? What is knowledge? What is bias? Is using chat cheating? So this is now in front of us. I don't think we realize, I'm much more worried about this than that because it's really working and programmers are starting, are using ChatGP to program. A lot of people being kind of quiet about it, but they're getting enough out of it where it's changing. And the one thing I worry about is the evil folks haven't fully there yet, but scammers, marketers, fake bots, like it's good enough where there's gonna be a deluge of crap coming that in some ways I'm happy about because politicians sometimes just don't understand any of this stuff. And the deluge is gonna be ugly, but at least as a human race, we can kind of go, uh, we gotta do something about this and now. Um, so I do think we have to do that. I talked a little bit about weird and wrong, why it elucidates. So it just pulls to the most obvious training set. Um, and then I'm gonna leave this for later, but I'm doing this early, so maybe you think of yours. My number one ethical issue, understanding and thinking about these systems, is actually uh, uh, maybe I'll not to this one. I'm I'm not a, I'm I'm very I talk all the world about ethics and what we should do and push back. Except for this one, I think this one is backwards. So there's a notion now that um, that artists are going to be out of jobs, um, and they're suing, and there's now a, a backlash. And there's also a, an opt-out notion. I want to take my art out of the system because someone's using it. Now, 
this is complex. So and I have a kind of real divergent view. So I'll just start it quickly and then we'll move on. But my thing is, oh my goodness, I just did you did you not get these billions of images here? And no one is stealing one thing. It's like patterns from all of them. And you know, so I think you're deluded to think it's just taking your art. Also, this is and again, I'll I'll get into it. So this this is a learning system. Uh, given my biggest issue that I'll bring up in a second, uh, if it learns poorly, it's going to go bias. And in bias, literally, we'll be killing people, putting people in jail. We, we just like a baby, we have to give it good data. So pull it, uh, this notion that Picasso is now long dead, and he's three, two generations later, somebody owns Picasso's IP, and he can go in, they can kind of say, we don't think Picasso should be in any art book ever. It's like, well, what would art, uh, that would be such a, a devastation to the education of artists and people around the world. And I tend to think similarly um, that I, I don't want to, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about that um, here. Uh, so, so looking back to, to my issue, is if if this is if we're not putting realness in it, it's that's a real issue. This is this is a young thing that is learning on data, and already we're seeing problems. So the notion that people want to take data out, could companies take data of how they mucked up? Can we take could companies take environmental data out? I, I just don't like the idea that anyone can take data out of a learning set. So I understand that there's definitely an issue. With a particular kind of commercial artist, and I'll bring that up in a second. But my thing is bigger than that. My thing is bigger than that is I usually have an example I don't, so I'll just do it. There's something called in painting. So in painting is if you have a photograph and there's a hole in the photograph, like it's just not there or it's damaged, or right? Adobe has it, it will in paint. That means it could fill in what goes there. You guys have watched TV shows which you also are doing super resolution. Oh, there's a license plate. And somehow with AI, we can zoom in on it. So these are all the same thing to say, we have real data, but somewhere we don't. So let's put BS interpolated data there. So what is that data? Well, the data is given that face in that mode, with that lighting, given my new data set of faces, I will put in, I will fill that in. Did you know the person? Because no, 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 I will do it by taking what is the closest thing to that in the average, meaning it's never gonna put a scar. It's never gonna you know, maybe know that there's, so in the end of the day, that's gonna go in there. And whatever that part is, or res dot or whatever, is going to be the most obvious thing in the whole data set. Again, in a way, hallucinating or gravity applied to Oh, I have faces, and what do you know? There's more right faces, or more this kind of thing, or faces that don't have blemishes that you might have, and that's what it's going to put in. So it puts that in. It's not good. The rest is real. This is not real. I call it interpreted, interpolated. It's close, but not real. Good. We put that in. We put that. We put that in for bad tomatoes. We put that in for medical decisions. And then what happens? Well, we're going to retrain on fake data, at least parts of it will be fake. And then that's in the system. And then something else goes, and then it's interpolated. You do this for 10, 15, 20 years, and obviously you're moving reality away from minority and variation and towards averageness. And that really worries me. I think people will start showing to border guards and getting in trouble because the, the data has been pulled in particular directions. So the only way to deal with this is to label it. And right now we have no idea. And obviously labeling is a good thing because from all this other stuff I was telling you, you would know when it's a bot versus not a bot. It's not an easy situation because some of the bot was written by a person and some of the bot was the bot like vamping. So, and even if you think of, of a face, it's like, oh, is this face real or not? It's like, well, this part is real. This part over here was put in, but with some real data. So it's, it's not easy how to label, but I'm working with groups about trying to get it to label. Okay, so I started with some of the problems and the disruption. I wanted to rapidly 
go through, okay, so how does this stuff work so we understand that? Okay, so what is AI? Well, obviously it's a conglomerate of all these things. We're using math and logic to put it together. Most AI systems uh, I'll only work in a particular domain like medicine so you have to understand this and then things like that. One of the things that people don't get, most of the best AI is only good if the person doing it is a master musician who's, who's writing the AI. So, and, and is mentoring it. So there's very few of, I don't know anything about anything. I don't know anything about a field, but I think I could, I could ask the AI if it can, can come up with a better X-ray MRI and analytic machine to see a particular kind of cancer, right? That, that probably is not gonna happen, right? So, um, you know, there's this notion that it's, if we understood the brain, of course we don't, and if we understood intelligence that in some way we're modeling in this in some comp computational form. Um, also that it's gonna have significant impact on society, whether that's good or bad, or at least be direct, disruptive, or your, here's my, my thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these knowing that. Um, So other people say, oh, it's AI is about a thinking machine, you know, and you can see what it says here. It's about the study of, of the brain and cognitive things in this field, or it's just, it's just a variant of computer science. When people kind of go wild and tell me, is it alive? And should we give it special rights? I was going, well, let's see, AI? What kind of AI is this? Oh, it's deep learning. Oh, okay, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of computer science. So would you give other programs? Like it's just computer science. And one aspect of it, it really is just code written by humans appearing artificially to be intelligent. Intelligence becomes the issue then. Obviously it's got something to do with learning. One of the things we're not really at yet with these deep learning systems is the adaptation. In fact, most deep learning systems, which is just another problem, which is why it's such a funny name that they named it deep learning, is in fact learning on a dead training set. So there's a training set, and sometimes the training set is so big that you only could be a Google or, or an open AI. You have a building bigger than this entire building filled with GPUs working for months to, to get these weights that I'm going to be showing you in a second to get this working. And once you do, you, then there's inference. Inference is what you do on your side. Go, oh, I ask it a question. You know, it'll come back with something. But that's doing it from this big understanding of, of this training set. And often the next training set, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, GPT-4, takes months to come out. There's so many people who are saying, oh, I typed this thing in. And then it learned it later. It's like, no, I didn't learn anything. It can't, it can't learn anything. No, not on the fly. It can learn it. You mean if I'm using Midjourney and I, I say what kind of art I like, it's like, well, there could be UI there that's just cheating. But no, the, the, in no way is it learning in real time from you. That's just not how it works. Most people don't fully understand that. Um, and, you know, does it solve problems? How does it learn? Um, obviously, I mentioned that AGI would be true of all domains. And we talk about it a lot as if it exists. And we're using the other system, what we call weak AI or these deep learning systems like, you know, uh, to say that, but it isn't. But but wait a minute, Steve, this this LLM systems like chatbot, it looks like it knows everything. It's like, no, 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 it's limited to BSing about words. So it turns out words written by humans in books appears to be about knowledge, but it is really just, just finding, you know, based on what you said, I will grab words. It's so amazing that with GPT-3 and 4, that it, it appears now that it's really doing things because, and there's some, and we don't even fully understand how it's, how it seems to be putting good information together, but it's basically a, a very strange librarian who has the history of all, you know, just behind him is every book possible and somehow statistically could grab from every one of them in particular order to do something, right? Uh, the big question is, what is intelligence without context? Does it even make sense? Is there something that's called pure intelligence? Obviously, companies are adding bias or removing bias. It is really interesting now that the two biggest complaints, and they're, this woke word is through the roof these days, but you know, they're going, oh, they made it so woke. I, you know, it turns out in the journey, you can't, you can't make breasts, you know, and oh my, even the word blah, blah, blah is censored. Oh, this is, this is just terrible. So in some ways, they think they're censoring it too much. And obviously, in some ways, like with the New York Times thing, it's totally, oh no, it's it's really talking about killing people. 
So obviously, you know, does intelligence have censorship in it? Does, but should it at least have things like fairness and, and good and ethics and empathy uh, and creativity? Is that part of it? Do we want our robots, so to speak, to have some of this in it or do we just want them to be clean and we keep that on our, on our side? So without knowing what intelligence is or how the brain works, you can see why this is a problem. I'll mention in AI that there's so many different kinds of AI and only a small part of it is in fact uh, deep learning neural nets. So let's just do it, do the deep dive part and look at of all the possible ways you can do AI. Here's my genetic algorithms over here that evolves to intelligence. And that's what I did for a lot of my artwork, but also for the Sims characters. But here's, here's the machine learning side of the world. So let's, let's just talk about only that since that's where there's a lot going on. So machine learning is all over the place. Uh, uh, people don't realize how it's now starting to be in a number of systems. Um, the, sometimes you see machine learning, sometimes you so deep learning. Machine learning was more handcrafted. It couldn't be very big. And certain things happen now with deep learnings that have deeper ways where you didn't have to kind of handcraft. I, I'll show you that I handcrafted with a, a colleague um, this, 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 the, the, these, uh, these whales, these AI whales that went into the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, the other way is, no, 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 we're, we're so good. As long as this is a huge data set, it can figure out, it, it, could, it could just learn it all we all. We don't have to handcraft it. It's a slightly good time to talk about AI for social good. So one area of AI for social good might be, ever, all this is controversial, is a system touching you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, these uh, beluga whales, how many people in Vancouver, it's getting, they don't have them anymore, uh, have seen the beluga whales in the aquarium. Uh, they were not in a very big tank, and you might even I use the word torture at times, which is a lot of animals. It's amazing to have zoos and aquariums, so the young people could have a sense of nature, but having, having the Bengal tiger walk back and forth in the smallest cage ever in the Bronx Zoo where I grew up, just, you know, and obviously I wasn't really looking at a Bengal tiger. I was looking at a Bengal tiger who's lost its mind, Bengal tiger. So could we understand all that in the brains of a, of a, of a and so eventually there was a lot of protests for these, these beluga whales as well that heralded in 20 years earlier that, that Vancouver had a tittle whales uh, in these tiny tanks and it didn't, didn't make a lot of sense. So you use a lot of AI techniques here. All these have papers behind them. So if there's something interesting, I'm just going rather fast. You know, um, this is the real beluga whale. These are ours. We do a, a lot better at the rendering and how they look. So one of the notions, and I actually have done some tours of the AZA, the American Zoological Association, which the aquarium works with about zoos and aquariums. You replace all animals in zoos and aquariums and keep them in the wild and project them via AI and computer graphics. So that's kind of lame. I want to see a real well, right? And so there are issues with that. It's changing. It's the magnetic. Cool. Um, but imagine this well is a well in the Pacific North, North Sea. And for this well, we've put a sensor on him. Uh, for the Bengal tiger, he's in an area where we have trip cameras and drones all over the place. And we can get, and we might even be able to get data on, on his eyesight with a camera and, and maybe how he's feeling. Um, and it is, a it is Joey the Bengal tiger. So when you go to the aquarium, you're seeing Joey, Joey's actually real now in the wild where he's meant to be. And we're just taking data and trying to show you that. Um, so this is um, obviously some real controversy here and I'm calling it for AI for social good. It turns out uh, we kind of got thrown off with, uh, with COVID, but it turns out that we were asked after this project to, um, there's a full scale aquarium build that was happening in North Italy, and it was going to have their prized bottle note that dolphins, and they 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 had such protests. But they're trying to the building is ready to get built. It was on the coast that they were redoing, um, and they've asked for a completely AI simulated 
one. So we're doing all the things that you've been to aquariums, like, oh, the great jellyfish are going to come up and then go back down again, and all this stuff. Every time there are practical issues, do you make these whales and jellyfish do things that jellyfish don't do to make them more interesting? In the end of the day, just like Disneyland, this is a place that has to make money and get people in. And there's always going to be lawyers and marketing people go, could you just could you just turn the dial to 11 a little bit more? It's like, no, this is what this is what Joey does. Can you have Joey dance? Because that would really get so there's a real notion of how far to go. And and uh, we have we have Reese in the room who does a lot in the in the documentary space. And there's a notion of even with documentaries, is is it is it exactly what happens or is it edited in a way? To look, to look more significant. And obviously, if you're trying to tell a story, that's okay. So how much of the story is, if the story is real, you know, maybe you can pull it. Surely movies push that a little bit. It's really not obvious how you do that. The one big thing we have is that the jellyfish, if you put on Italian classical composers, will slightly move, turn, with the, with the music, that's as far as we've gone. The other things we've done is in a very big room like this, these artificial ones, uh, we don't want anyone to drive a mammal or a fish, but again, with this notion of drones, we could claim that there's an actual drone, even though it's just a 3D drone, that somebody can control from somewhere else. So in this 3D environment, people can move the drone around, which is really great with, with the flocking, looks so cool. We're talking about this drone that you can open up an umbrella, so to speak, on the front, so the, the fish have to go around it. And then if you have two people at booths doing that, you know, it's, it's, it's you're, you're kind of working with them more. So you're, you're implying that there's a virtual drone, which is at least a real thing, as opposed to actually saying, I'm changing the fish. But it's, it's quite controversial. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about what this main system does. So this is a, by the way, this is called, this word here, which you've never seen, is called neural network. And you see machine learning all over the place and deep learning all over the place. But the truth of the matter is there's many kinds of machine learning systems. The one that is really taken off is this neural net, which is trying to reproduce um, kind of the, the brain neural net. And then deep learning is only trying to make this thing have more hidden layers in these. Um, the main thing I want you to think about if you're new to this is this. In the end of the day, all we're changing is the weights, the weights fire, and in the end of the day, we just get one answer out. So is it a cat or a dog? So unlike other kinds of AI, machine learning and especially deep learning is really category basic. So I've, sh I've shown you a bunch of trees, a bunch of telephone poles. I'm gonna give you one I haven't shown yet. Is it a tree or a telephone pole? And it can't do all the magical things you're thinking if, if it's really just this category. So it's optimized to do this as well as possible. Um, and it's all statistical because all you're doing is changing these weights. And then you're, you're seeing just like with the brain, what is firing in the end, what neuron is firing in the end. So it's a statistical based approach. Again, similar to how the brain works, but in this case, these nodes, we don't do much on the nodes. We do a lot on weighting the nodes to see if they fire or not. And there's two basic kinds of training here um, because you need a big training set. Either you label everything ahead of time, which is called supervised learning, or you don't. The don't is trickier, obviously, but it, it's easier to get that data. And the don't, you know, well, these things seem different than those things. So I don't, I don't know what to call them, but I know that they cluster differently. And in that clustering, this is probably cats and this is probably dogs. And I don't know what I'm gonna do with the exception. Most of what we're seeing in the systems that we're talking about are supervised. Well, I have no idea where it goes to color or not color. Okay, so there is another kind of deep learning called reinforcement learning, which I don't kind of talk about, but it mainly is the only one that is live. So it basically it tries something and then it gets a it, was that good or not good? And if it's not good, go, okay, I won't do that. I'll go another way. So it's just this reward-based system, and they're doing a lot in gaming. The reason I bring it up especially here is because these two are what chat GPT is. So another if, if issue is they have to label a lot of data. They don't label it the old way anymore, which is saying dog or cat. They want to say, like I've said, 
a cat eating kibbles on a bench. So they, they want more of a language system. And unfortunately, they tend to use mechanical Turk or prolific systems that maybe you know about. And they're paying people often in Africa and other places minimal, minimal wage to, to label things. This, that's bad. Even worse is they give those people probably very little information about what to do. Again, if you were the design firm in Denmark who wants to who would do the next level of this about how people feel about design objects, you, you wouldn't just do this brute force ridiculous one without any information. In fact, no one does anything like that without any, just label whatever you see, who cares? We don't, because we just want so much of it. And that's why we had hallucinations, all that stuff. So we did that and GPT-3 was pretty crappy. Um, so they came out with this new GPT-3 a bit ago that was human corrected. So they started having same thing, poorly paid people playing with kind of an early chat GPT. And every time it did something wrong, it, you, you, just, you just fixed it. And, and to, so I'm after that happened. And the reason chat GPT is so good, it's nothing but GPT-3, soon three, five and four, um, cleaned by this. So all they did was kind of go, oh, it's a lot of money to pay all these poor people to fix things. How about if we look about how they fixed it and then we could do this error correction system and we can actually just fix it ourselves really fast. And that's what chat GPT is. It's these two together. If you heard Jan Lacan, who is a, from Montreal, who's, who's head of Facebook research and the father of, of in deep learning, um, he was saying, you, you do realize it sucks. And the way they made it better is to take out the parts that really suck. So they never made it better. They just are getting rid of the, so, and it's pretty bad, it's spewing, but we've at least filtered some of the bad spewing. And of course he's saying, as we move to AGI and other things, wouldn't it be good if we just had a better system? Do you know, though, nowhere is reasoning and thinking in any of this. This is simply, you say crap to me, I look at what the words are, based on that, I find other words, I don't know what the words are, I just kind of move it in. You know, there's some level of meaning, but not much. Uh, so the, that's, what, that's why chat GPT hit. Again, you might claim that humans do some kind of version of this, but they, if you have a picture, if, if you have the word, if you have a sentence, there's a cat drinking milk and a picture of a cat drinking milk. In the old days, by the way, and I usually have these slides, but for speed, I'll just do it quick. We could say, there's a cat in the picture, like when you saw a cat. And it would just, somewhere there's a cat in the picture, there could be other things in the picture, who knows? Then we got into bounding boxes, which is, okay, this is the cat part. Then we got into segmentation, which is saying, no, these pixels are the cat. And then we got into segmentation where we're segmentating everything. Oh, so this is the cat, this is the milk, this is the thing, and there's a cat drinking milk. And now we have a text pair, cat drinking milk, picture of a cat where it knows everything. If you have that, that's why I'm changing my mind. Oh, there is meaning in here. I just brought in two new PhDs for my lab who are going to really get into this meaning issue because I think it's, it's just early days and we need to think it through. But if you have cat drinking milk and cat jumping on a table and cat, and you have a thousand text image pairs of a cat, who's to say that isn't Reese's brain of what a cat might be? At some point, you're realizing, oh, there's a lot there. And of course, that's, that still wouldn't be enough. And there's something for speed, maybe I'll just talk about it here. What we do is we now do embedding. So we're going for meaning, not just the word cat. So we have cat drinking milk and the picture of a cat drinking milk in a grid. And in that grid, it gets a perfect one because it is a cat drinking milk and the picture of it. Next to that is the, is the next one, which is dog eating kibbles and dog eating kibbles. It gets a one in its column, but for the uh, is that cat drinking milk? Oh, it's close, close. It's way closer than man entering building. And this is where we are now, where meaning is starting to come into these systems because we now have nearness. We have to say, these are animals, these are animals eating. This is different than this other thing. And we're moving into this meaning space in, in somewhat of a way, maybe the way we really do it as humans, we really don't know back to this what is intelligence. So um, why did this stuff get good? Because it used to be crappy around my, my uh, uh, well days 
like we it was like it was slow and you know and it really took off. It 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 didn't change that much except the GPUs got so much faster, right? And everyone's using GPUs now. And the data sets got tremendously bigger. And then we got smart, where I can get into it, where we don't in that neural network just do everything evenly. We're just really smart about making it more efficient. Obviously, if there's a picture of a cat and it's in a particular lighting and now it's in a different lighting it's a, and it's a three-dimensional thing, you know, it, at least it's like pooling things together so it doesn't have to think and it's putting rainbow colors in it things things to make it smarter about uh, angle lights and color that actually sped this up so we've gotten a lot better but the main thing we did this kind of went crazy with this large data set we don't do it. i usually give this other example i will for those nerds in the room uh, uh, when a new cpu came out let's say it was one gigahertz Sometimes it literally went, oh my God, it's 50%. It's, it's half the price and it's 100% faster. It's two gigabytes. This is amazing. And then people are like, oh, I'm going to warn you. We, there's this rule that we're going to just hit this physical thing. But we did. And somewhere around five gigahertz, we just did. We just hit it. So then how come we don't ever talk about that we hit this limit? Are we okay? Well, we're, we're now, you know, we went from, from very small to better to better with five. Oh, damn wall. Okay, what do we do here? Oh, can we make two of them? Yeah, sure. Let's. Right, let's go down from five gigahertz back to four and make two of them. And now you know that you have four or eight or 16 of them. So we literally hit a wall. No one could make them any better. Like, oh, we'll just make a lot of them. It's like, yeah, but if I'm only doing one thing, yeah, just, you're not going to get much out of that. But if you're doing a lot of things, you know, you know, so this is what happened with deep learning a little bit, which is the current revolution, which is they just said, how about if we just make it 10 times bigger? What happens when we hit everyone? What happens when you, and that really has changed things. Again, GPT-2 did not get the recognition I was using it that GPT-3 and chatbot has. So we hit some level. We do all these things with, with the, by coding it with vectors and tensors for speed. So that's another way we can speed it up. And in general, um, we just have this big neural network where we only change the weights. And if the weight is good enough, this thing will fire. And if that fires, then it goes to something else. We sum that, we just have more weights and more weights and more weights. And then at the end of the day, we just say, hey, was that, we trained it and say, is that a cat? Say, oh yeah, it's a cat, no, it's a dog, you got that wrong. But you got some of them right. We'll back propagate the weights until we have the best system possible. And that's literally what training is. It's a very different way of the old kind of way we used to do computer science. This is the new kind of way for the computer science people in the room. I would tell you that programming just might go away and if you want an AI whisperer, you know, in other words, if you could describe what you, what you want to do to this system, that we're, this notion is different. This is the 500 foot view. It happens in a lot of things. I, I kind of like that, which is, oh, in Photoshop, I can do every little thing. Or I can just say, I could just be a producer and say there's five people doing Photoshop or a conductor and say, this is what I want to say, you do it and you get to pull back and see. So there'll be a, a bit more of that. And I can tell you there's very many people who bought the $20 open AI thing because it's making their coding better and they're coding very differently. So again, we have this training set. So we just say, here's the cat, here's the dog or every picture in the world label. But we hold some back, uh, we, we start giving some without the label, and we see if we can get the label right. And this is where we just train the system and make it better. Okay, so that's the basic system. Over time, it, it kind of moved towards to being as good as possible, and then we send it out. Remember those, the, these, these, these nodes um, kind of hold information. And the, this, this would be the more lower level one. Notice it's like diagonals and spots. So almost like our vision goes. And then those, these aren't new ones. These are put together from these. So you would imagine these could be the low level ones, but six of these firing could get you one of these and then so on and so on. So this stuff all builds on each other. This doesn't have smart, this only has smarts in it because of the smarts from things before it until you decided the top layer, can we let of the things you told me to know, to, can I say what I think I see here? Or And that, that's how you can see it here. This low level is almost very similar. Uh, 
And then in this case, we'd be putting trains together more and more. You can imagine this, you could do this for faces and cars and things like that. So this is the basic system that we're using to do this. Um, so for speed, I'm just gonna mention that that's what a neural network is. That's what a deep neural network is. Everything I, we've just talked about only uses those systems, but they got better. And the way they got better is we're just similar to the CPU. We just started using more than one of them in smarter ways. So if you've heard of a GAN, which is the first beginning of kind of AI art system, that was saying, well, rather than just kind of sending it in, how about if we jam a little bit of noise on the actual ones and seeing if another AI, another neural network could tell the difference. And it turns out this GAN, which is an adversarial network, this somebody's trying to fool it and somebody's trying to get it right, that this changed, uh, heralded in these new systems. Well, if adding noise is a good thing, then we, we just fully went for it. So the diffusion models, which took over from the GAN models, are simply, I have something in training. I'm going to add noise with nothing but noise. And I'm going to use a particular Markov chain way of doing it. So I should be able to go backwards. And this is great because it means you can start from noise, on, which is kind of nothing, and go to anything quicker and better because you, you, you have the formula to go back and forth. And that's exactly all you know, these AI art systems do, except for this part. This part is the, it's called CLIP, also from OpenAI. It's just the text, it's just the text part. A, a, a corgi playing a frame, a flame throwing trumpet, and you can see that's what we get. And so you're, you're mixing the, the language model and you're thinking about it. Um, because you have in clip these text image pairs I've talked about, and you have a smartness about how to do that, well, that's what's making all this stuff. So in a way, the, the vision stuff um, is, is both the, the not, if we just get quickly to the, the newest systems to show you that it's all real stuff, um, is um, what we call encoder decoder. We just have many of these uh, systems at one, and sometimes you want things, and they're called RNNs, which are recursive. You want them, anything that goes over time, like music, you can't just have one. You have to have a whole bunch of them in time. And in the end, they were just really cheap. They would just do like the delta and hope that it looked together. But that's what's doing. And surely that's exactly what you would want in the language system, language is stuff over time. So it started by using these very simple systems. And then we moved into transformers which didn't have to do them in order anymore, but just do them like the entire sentence at the same time. So that got better. Then we got into what we call attention or self-intention. We, it's telling me I should go fast. Um, uh, where we, we cared about, you can say, hey, there's words that are more important than other words. Maybe I should give that more time. And we came up with this encoder decoder system. You might have spent time on it other than say, neural network, neural network, neural network. So now that we're doing, neural networks in pieces to be smart. And that's what a transformer is. It is the encoder side and the decoder side, encoder, decoder. Um, uh, and it does a lot of fancy stuff. But in the end of the day, in the, in, I'm going into the word space. It's, uh, it's trying to give attention. Oh, it must, could it be it, the street is the it or the animal is the it? So it's starting to do some kind of knowledge-based stuff. Uh, multi-head attention is doing that all at the same time. Um, so that's the, the, this cutting up and adding a lot more neural networks. In the case of vision, we do that with CNNs where we're grabbing just parts of the picture. In the case of GANs, we're putting in that, that random noise. And in the case of this encoder decoder, we're doing it kind of in a way. And I talked just very quickly about reinforcement learning and how that works. Um, so just maybe just finishing with this, this thing over time, if we put an image in, we might want a caption out. So you would say that's putting, uh, so yeah, that putting in, so the other way around, you're putting, yeah, you're putting in a vector of this and you want to get a sequence out. Um, and then if it's sequence to sequence, you obviously want to put in like a word in one language and put in a word in another language. And we can do this now in multiple ways. The red dog, I told you earlier, everything just turns to single vectors and this makes everything really quickly. And then they realized where now meaning is starting to go in. Oh, these, these are near each other. 
I'm not sure how compared to other things, but they are near each other. Um, so I, I, I now can encode nearness. I can, I can also encode where it happens in the sentence because that's different. So we can code that too. So basically, just very quickly, what's happening here, rather than saying, oh, there's a word with our neural network, now it's trying to like, okay, well, I'll abstract the word plus where it is. I'll abstract the word with what's near it. And then you still get like a funny little encoding number that actually starts having some level of meaning in it if we're back to there's a cat eating milk. And you know, somehow that's close to it, you know, color. So that's the positional stuff. All this is just in that encoder. We can we can kind of do that now and get these attention vectors. Uh, we if it was just and the decoder could turn that into a different language. And you can see how we're putting that all together. So that is the system. That's what has made GPT-3 because they went so incredibly big, they actually started cutting some of this intention stuff out and said, you know, for speed, we don't need everything because we can't we can't do it as big as we wanted to. So why don't we just go super big and have it predict the next world? So that's what it did, and it was trained on 12 billion books, and then again on 55 billion books. You could see at some point they're going more data. This is the biggest library in the world. This oh, yeah, we don't have any more books, so I don't know what to tell you. So okay, well, well it's going to get all the internet. So you can see that number is even higher. I tend to think that's the problem that common Wikipedia probably has some errors in it, but I can tell you people BSing on, on Reddit probably has a lot of ridiculous stuff in it and it could get pulled in that direction. So when you're seeing here's GPT-2, here's GPT-3, you can see how it's, you know, compared to everything else, it's just not even in the same planet. GPT-4 that just came out is, is, is the same thing all over again. So this bigger is better approach is a way of kind of doing things. So how, how did this stuff get good? Well, you know, it, it started using 40 million image text pairs. It, uh, uh, it's putting those together in the system that I told you about. So you might have it in the next slide, but this would be cat eating uh, 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 milk, drinking milk, and this would be a one, and this would be dog. So this is called now an embedding system, which is starting to say, these things are near each other. And this is really, even if you're not doing language, this has really been a boon to the system. So they have that pre-training now, they've made it efficient, and they have these visual and, and, and language things together. And all of a sudden you're into, you know, some pretty significant space. So I should check time on my over or a little bit more. Uh, it's like 1.40. So we do want some time for discussion. Okay, so I'm gonna now, um, so that was a bit of a deep dive in the space. I did wanna show you what some of this stuff looks like. So um, surely, you know, you could use this art even in performance spaces. So this is a, a one that I did at the Museum of Modern Art. This is one at, at, at MIT that has, that is evolutionary and growing. Uh, also for social good, this is work that I did with, in fact, Reese and, and Kate Hennessy in UBC. This notion of that artists um, know how to put in the most important stuff and leave out what isn't. If we could learn that for everybody, there's too much data. If you could take what's most important and emphasize it more and, and bring down everything else for everything. But in this case, this is just for in a documentary sense where people have to be private. They, they, they tend to pixelate the face and you're not, you're not getting the emotion on the face. This is one way to do it with a cubist kind of technique. Uh, we do it where um, the, the person themselves is able to decide how, how, how much they want to do and how much they don't want to do. Uh, we went cubist because it means no pixel. You can't go backwards with other AI. It's actually grabbing a bunch of pixels and calling that a cube area. So in a way it's really hard to go backwards. And we can get different looks. If somebody's happy, they might like this. We could make them more stringy. So that's another AI that's able to tell the look on their face and maybe the stress in their voice and uh, change things that way. So they can tell their stories. Obviously this can be used in very negative ways. Some of that has a lot to do with, with being able to segment out. But the important thing is this segmentation thing is really good now. And people don't know how much it's gonna change everything. If you can take my body and separate it, from the back and are we doing that? Yes, in every camera there is when you use selfie mode. The reason it's getting blur in the back and here 
is because it's really just taking the picture twice and it knows how to do a perfect map. You might call it an alpha map. As soon as you can do that, well, you kind of don't need motion capture and a number of other things anymore because from that, you can probably get the, the bone structure and then you can do mocap. So I think there's a, there's a lot of back to disruption. All mocap might die to this technique, all like people who would, who would paint things out that might have to go away. But then all these smart things happen where you can, you can put anything together. And from a reasoning standpoint, if I can cut you out of the desk you are and say, these are people, and that one over there is nodding, and that one over there is doing this, well, this is exactly what they're doing in self-driving cars right now, to say, oh, this person is walking the street, that's just another car. And you, you know, it's segmentation. And then segmentation saying what you think it is, that is, that it changes the world back to this notion of meaning that I've been talking a lot. Okay. So one of the things is the, the meaning is all messed up. It's whatever comes out of these stupid systems. So we're spending at least a little bit of time in our research lab kind of rethinking, no, no, what is a good emotional meaning space in this case, you know, and other studies to actually use the history of cognitive science and social science and anthropology. So well, we have these systems already. How come we're not using those systems um, um, with large models? So we're doing a lot of training to do that, and we're able to move between different spaces. Um, some of it is using sensor systems to do that because you can get information. So this would be one example of a way of doing that, that this is a counselor. The counselor could just tell somebody, you know, you need to calm down, or could create a dream of herself, go into that dream in the calm mode, and grab this person and bring them in. So here is Awana, and she's got the Muse headband on. And when she breathes, this is kind of breathing in, and this is breathing out. So um, she's doing that. There we go. So there's the breathe in and breathe out. Um, and then, um, then she's using, in this case, because it's the Muse, it's a brain system. So she's using some calming techniques to own this flocking sequence. And now we just bought in. Uh, the patient who's got a VR glasses on. So in a way, this patient is going through the world that she's creating. Uh, Reese again, Alex Kitson, whose PhD was here, also has this notion of creating a dreamlike world. So ultimate creation, you could just, whatever you want to create, you can create if you wanted to. She's doing it to understand dreaming and also this the notion of lucid dreaming where you can do that. We've done some work in that space as well, too. So that's using this Muse headset that we both have used. This is her lucid dreaming work. Um, and then there's also obviously having talking characters and putting them together in different kinds of ways and bringing in the emotion there. So I think I'm going to end with just, just talking to Picasso and then I'll call it a day. So I was at a conference at Cambridge, and luckily I was the last day, and it was on art and ethics and AI. And I, we, I was able to ask our um, system that uses all this stuff with 3D, all the questions at the conference. So it's trained on everything about Picasso. It acts like Picasso. It's a bit of a jerk because it really does act like Picasso in some ways. Um, I think I, So I was going to do it live. Hello, Pablo. How are you feeling today? I'm good. I am thinking about art and ethics. Do you have anything to say about ethics and the world? I believe art brings out the best in people. It shows the world that we are not alone. Good quote. Didn't tell him to say it. So something about who Where he did is. you do most of your painting? In Paris or so Spain? I could go on with this. I think you get the idea. We've been, uh, this is with a company called Virtro. We have 15 of our students have gone on to work there. They're using bots like this to train 
uh, Im immigrants from, from Ukraine and Afghanistan in, in, in language. And even now there's a job training thing so they get used to seeing a bot that they, they train. Uh, it's, it's available in education. So this would be an example of the, of the language smart side of the world to put in something we're used to, which is a character. We have a bot that, that explains AI to you as well, and on and on. Um, okay, so um, I've tried to give you a, a bit of a deep dive in all these areas. And um, One sec. Go back. Um, so obviously, these systems use uh, sophisticated AI to even know what you're what you're thinking to some extent, because it's seeing your your face and the stress in your voice. You can see the ethical issues with how we would do that. I recently this, got a this dog. Person is like, uh, he's super he's cute. About he's house, just he's nothing. And, and he we have around a, the house. Yeah, he's so full cool of energy. Getting all this emotional. Um, but one this, day I came home and now it could be bed, direct, and I had to wash my sheets. And it was kind of gross. And, 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 and doing it in, in immersive in, virtual reality simulations. Medical healthcare for nurses, even working with gender and things like that. Okay, so um, I'm going to stop. And go, oops, go back to my questions. So what I was able to do is, is deep dive into AI. Sorry, that was rather than just show all my fun videos. There's a lot of other stuff. All this stuff has papers behind it from, from three just on the, uh, you know, the aquarium zoo work alone to, to, to facial work and others. Um, I don't have time to do it. And we didn't know how much we could do, but I, I will just get, I want to end on the ethics side. So your creation. So there are people now making skills on those um, on these diffusion models like Midjourney. Midjourney charges about thirty dollars a month and has over twelve million users. So they're at least making thirty million a month. Those are gamers who've left playing games, making sometimes utter baloney um, because they can make it for the first time, and this might hurt commercial artists because you can kind of do that kind of thing. I did want to bring up this kind of very significant inference that we have two papers and a study that we're, we're putting in on. Um, um, we all know that crypto currency uses so much energy in, in its work mode that there's been plenty of articles how that's really going to affect climate change. We're seeing a worse situation with these, these, these visual AI art models. It turns out they're much more lean. So in general, making one thing, which we how long that takes us and so bad, times 20 million people, everything changes. And from a waste perspective, none of these people are realizing that this stuff is, you know, you, you, they know when they brush their teeth, they should turn the water off. They know they should lower all these things they know, but, but no one has talked about this. We've also seen that a lot of what they make is never looked at again in a minute so it, it's basically you know a, a waste object and they maybe should be thinking about that so we've calculated those numbers and it's really significant um, a lot of people in this industry um sorry in the climate change ai ethics group which i'm doing work in is more looking at the training uh, you know these huge open ai google computers but we're also looking at the usage side um and while it seems bad it's going to be much worse because these are skills so it turns out there's something really exciting about never being able to draw, and now you can, and you're just making stuff all day long, anything that you want to. Um, so so you get a you get an endorphin out of it, and you want to do more and more of it. And when we present you with this, could be bad for the environment. Where we are noticing that, and that's exactly what we did. We kind of asked them their opinion on on on, on climate change, and we explained what's going on here. And they're like, no, but not this. This is my fun stuff. Um, so it's going to be big, and it stills today. So it's rapidly moving to video, and then it's going to rapidly move to, to VR. Those will be, again, much bigger. And then in the same boat, not a paper yet because it's hard to get data, I'm claiming 
that it's the drug of the future and it's very dangerous. So because you're getting an endorphin hit from, make, from pure creation, making your dreams, um, yes, yeah, stills is okay, but making VR worlds, I had a bad day. So I'm gonna redo my whole thing. Oh, I, I saw a woman in the street. I just wanted to be my girlfriend. Now, I mean, the ability to make a holodeck of what you want based on typing things. I, I'm worried that if, if, if it's 30 million, if it's 20 million just for stills, I, I'm really worried about this with me. And what this is, is just a definition for drug. There's the real world. Uh, I'm not doing well there. I want to get some kind of pleasure by an alt world that I can create. So I, I'm starting to talk about that. So these are some of the ethical issues I already brought up this labeling issue and then some others. Um, I would love if you think you have, you think there is an issue that I haven't discussed that maybe we could bring it up here. So anyway, at that point, um, all this stuff is available. I have a lab and we're doing it. Uh, if you're interested in, in getting involved, that's, that's good too, but hopefully you have a better sense of what AI really is, the deep dive part, and some of the issues around it from good to bad. Thank you. Did you did you hear that uh, Microsoft axed their uh, AI ethics? Yes, I heard it from your post first, so there you go. Help. Um, although then I looked a little, and that was like a separate group, and they're claiming, you know, I'm not claiming this is any better, but there are other AI ethics people in the company that they decided, very Microsoft, which is just going to be terrible, is, well, wait a minute, we're, we just spent X billion dollars on this open AI thing, you know, called ChatGPT or GPT-4 that's hitting why don't we just put it in all our products? So I think now that it's in all the products, they claim they're gonna, the ethics team is gonna be now not just this one team thinking about the future, but just thinking about it in all products, which I still think is just, just as bad, but that's been their, their, slight, their slight pushback. Um, so one way to think about things, if we think about the US election and, and, and conspiracy theories online. How do we, you know, should Twitter and Microsoft kind of censor those out and then we give them a hard time when Facebook doesn't and doesn't. I'm of the belief that they, none of them should censor it out because they're companies and they have biases and they shouldn't even have AI groups. What they should do is what we've done for every other industry, whether it's the MIDI standard format for music or that there's gotta be this thing on every electrical device there is because somebody tests it. There should be, they should all be paying into a fund where, where a group is actually doing that. And they could kind of, they could come up with numbers. Oh, this is like super duper one for kids. And this is, this is standard two. So at least then Google could say, we're using three, you know, Microsoft are using four. But the notion that I need Facebook or Microsoft to, to, to pay people with this greed factor in the back of your head doing it, I think that would at least be my issue. I, I even get weedy when I hear that Facebook is trying to do the right thing. It's like, Facebook will never do the right thing. They're by definition. Uh, did you not see the Zuckerberg movie? Like, it's just like, it's real, right? Um, so I would rather um, that somehow that's an outside group, like we have, you know, for so many, you know, for, for medicine, for other things. And I, that would be, I, I know that. That's not a great answer. And it's this, oh, we should just have it in this big, huge, expensive way that like, the world is wonderful. But I really, I really tend to be uncomfortable when, when companies are doing it, mainly because they can just fire people on the spot or say, yeah, don't worry about that. It's like, no, but this is no joke. Just, just worry about this other part. Um, and it is getting weird what they're censoring and what they're not censoring is, is starting to get strange. And if you're on the mid journey forums, they're always arguing why, why one, I mean, nude is censored. So like, oh, like a whole kind of artwork is impossible to do on, on some of these tools just because they, you know, a company has decided. And uh, with Stable Diffusion is, a, is, a, is not from a company um, and uh, it came out and still they look like they're getting sued. So I was using Stable Diffusion 1.4 and they went up to 1.5 and I said it was better, but it turns out 
what it was is they were censoring the hell out of things. So the Getty images wouldn't sue them. And then we're doing some deep work in meaning and we're doing a lot in this you know, space. And it turns out like Van Gogh-ness, just got so much worse. Am I going, there's no copyright for Van Gogh. What the hell's going on? And they basically dumbed down. If you start pulling things out, and this is back to my issue of can, can people opt out of these systems, you tend to dumb down the system. But yeah, I think the ethics issue, it's amazing that there isn't a class on it, you know, that there isn't a whole, and I think that's the only way to handle it at some point. It will be a field like all fields uh, and be done right. And hopefully there'll be scientists talking about it and standards rather than right now, companies doing it. There was somebody who saw this coming and they said, this is bad. This is not only bad now, when these things go super AI, uh, you know, and that's a super AGI and they're super smart and they've decided, you know, they could have the power to kill us. How are they going to do the right thing? And, you know, well, we got to teach it ahead of time. It's like, well, wait a minute. Apple's got one and they're pretty private about theirs and Google has one. What happens if Apple decides that they have the better one? And the Google one in the next year is going to go super in a way that they could just, they could kill the other ones, a very arms race thing. Why don't I take out Google and all of Silicon Valley where Google is, of course, Apple would be there, so that's not really a good analogy, um, because I want to save people, because I'm going to, and that would be bad. So there was a worry that we should not have private companies as they, so Google, not Apple, Elon Musk, and several others formed this company to say everything in it is open. Because it's oh, and we'll all put stuff into the AI, and then when we take it out, and there'll be no private AI. And it had a very simple name because it was open AI, and it was open AI. So open AI, the company that is completely closed, and won't do anyone how GP for work started as this 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 venture. Everyone claims Musk is doing it because he's not Google, Amazon, whatever. So he wanted to get the AI that everyone would get, but uh, he quit. He's not on the board anymore, it's nothing to do with it. And literally recently the open AI guy, yeah, we were wrong that initially about that, that altruistic stuff. Now we just say everything for Microsoft. So it, it is interesting that we've, like it's one of the biggest failures, but it, it's really odd because Musk has got you just so I don't wanna say it's, but this was the right idea. And obviously putting those people together made some of the best systems there are right now. And yet all along the way, Somebody, you know, in the front office goes, eh, I think we should make money. Don't you think we should make money? Yeah, let's just close everything down. And that, that's where we are now. And in fact, to this day, the GPT-4 is, everyone is complaining compared to Google's BARD and other systems is the, the most, they're not even explaining how it works now. So it's, it's quite an issue. Do we have artists in the room worried about the, my, my one of my more controversial ones was I'm a, I'm on the other side of the artist should opt out and we should we should you know they should be able to sue and, and I know not everyone agrees with that. Any thoughts on that one? No, you have a question. Um, yeah, like I, I think like the artist one's really interesting because like I have a friend she's very embedded into the artist community. And then, so there's a lot of commission happening and a lot of artists have to like declare like the software, the tools that they're using, the pens that they're using to the fact that to ensure that it's not AI art. Right. And then I think that's very interesting. It, it's kind of like a different lens, um, but like uh, it seems like the artist community and the, like the people who always commission for art, right. they're like trying to avoid AI art right. or they right. think that AI art is bad. Right, and it, it's not even obvious what the word actually means, AI art. Surely, like my friend here, um, computer art, digital art, video art, we've been doing that for a while. In fact, AI art is a subset of computational art. So where do you draw the line? Oh, I wrote a program, but I made sure it doesn't think well. You know, it, it just has no bearing. It's actually, Honestly, for me personally, it's just not a good time. I, I'm like a major AI artist who've been doing it for years and years at major museums. I'm just going, ah. so I'm trying to do things like this. We did this in a different setting, but but in the art design setting, I'm sure I'm bringing up. We've been doing AI art for thirty years, but what what you'd never had a problem there. Um, who are you talking about? Oh, the people using a commercial corporate tool. Did you think that's AI art? 
No, that's just some BS little program that people are using. That's ridiculous. That's like calling Word um, book, you know, book writing system. It's like, no, it's just Word. So it is kind of weird that this, just because so many people did it and they called it that name, unfortunately, which you know, as I try and call it confusion. Um, so it, it is it is quite tricky and you're right, there's a backlash on both sides. It's an up upcoming backlash for all of AI, right? So it's just, it's very, again, if you look at other ways we went from the industrial age to the info age, it kind of started, it started with music, right? And then everybody was using Napster and all this kind of stuff. And it really, the community was just crazed with, is it stealing, is it not stealing? And I think this is just, I, I don't, some people think that this AI thing is different and special, and it surely is an order of magnitude different, but it's the same old thing. So I have no idea, but there's a chance that people said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm using this new thing called acrylic. I paint with it. Acrylic, that's crap. Egg tempura, got to go back to using the egg or at least oil, but acrylic, that's just crazy stuff. We're going to ban that. So to me, this is just, you know, the new thing. There's plenty of artists, um, and I didn't really show much of my work, but there's plenty of artists using this new tool they use the tool for it to get them their, their soul out to people, which is the standard stuff. So it is a bit tricky, but there's a lot of people just doing utter and over crap. I could tell you that we just did a big study and we went to everyone who's using it and we asked them some things. And oh my God, it was not a pleasant situation. They were really not nice about what they were doing or not. So I think they're, they feel like they're getting attacked. And again, it's a drug and they're into it, but they're just making half of them are just making, you know, cartoon female babe women and somehow calling that AI art. My favorite, I, uh, Vanessa and I just did the study and we were surprised how we, we got the lowest completion rate. So we only get 60 sec, 66 of people. So when we, they hit the eight, when they hit the climate change question, they just stopped taking it. And they, and they said, this is a lie. Everything's a lie that you're saying now. Some, and then what was happening, it must've went around. Some of them were um, not completing everything. So they're going on, they just wanted to see what we were talking about because it's awful. And then, you know, we're trying to talk about something real. And it turns out version five of Mid Journey came out and someone was complaining, said, you know, there's a debate. And I sent it to Vanessa because it was the, the, our debate was actually on something real. Their debate was, Think, um, I'm not sure if I can actually use the word. Well, it's, I think boobalicious isn't too bad. I'll, I'll, I'll try it out. But uh, they were claiming that the new version, the breast size of the characters had defaulted smaller and they were affected that they now have to put something in the prompt. To, you know, it's like, really, that's, that's your argument, right? So we're in a funny state where these are really people just making visuals and calling it art, and it, it really is back and forth. It's complex, and there's no easy answer for it. Some of us, I would be one of those, but there's other artists, are trying to skirt around it a little bit. So I only use my own art as my source art, and then I vary, and then I journey through a space with it. So I can claim it's mine. It's this funny thing a lot of artists are doing, we're looking for all our old art, any art we've ever done, or not so much for, how good it is, but oh, it's got good blue in the middle and oh, this would be a good source. So it's it's this another way of avoiding the whose is it, right? Oh no, it's it's mine, you know, it started with me. Sorry, there was another. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what would you, how would you talk about the stylistic range of a tool like Mid Journey? What is the stylistic range? Right. That sort of. So I'm always, I'm always now pushing back almost mainly, not to you, but in general, like I go, you mean the one commercial app from a company that some people think is AI when it's in fact just their one dumb version of AI and in fact a cheapy one because they're just out to make it popular. Again, you know, breasts are bigger just so when you make babes, you're happy with making the baby. I think it definitely has a certain style. Mid Journey is a really odd one. It's a very smart person who did it. I don't know if some of you into VR, I have one in my back, but there's something called the Leap Motion, which was this great device that you can, we, we did work with it together, I think about it. And he, number one Kickstarter in the world, and he sold it, and he started a new company, and he saw what was going on, and he started Mid Journey, is, is David in his name. And he's, he reads a lot of sci-fi books, and he really does have an opinion 
that even though he's made all this money, that um, he's not trying to keep it even. He believes that in the future, there's going to be this mass creativity. And it's not one person being creative, it's everyone. So he, he actually has an agenda. So he does, I, I used to use Midjourney. I can show you some of the examples of it. I no longer use it because he, it, it literally from the top has a particular editorial style. And the one thing he does, and that's how you get to 30 million a month, is he's flavored it so untalented people can get something that's kind of good. So, so the trouble is everything was good, but that's the problem. It becomes templatized to that good. But that's the little bit of, of you know, endorphin dust that he wants to put on. So like, and then people like us were trying to change it and we're going, oh, I, I can't do it. He's he's kind of put too much of him in it. And so I, that's the trouble with a lot of these corporate ones. The stable diffusion one where it has its issues is in fact um, open and you can change the model when you're using it. Any other comments? wanted to show you some kind of art made from from some of these systems where I can I could journey where these are quite flat but if I wanted to I can just I can make them more three-dimensional or or go in very different directions kind of on the fly um, I'm still using the colors and feel from here but then I went to doghouse pun land and then and then back again to do other kinds of things and and this was you know uh, these are actually old, or the wrong number, but this is my interpretation of all of us in this very room realizing that they're finally going to open school again and some level of COVID is over and we can, we were in our houses and now we can go out of our house. So I have this kind of, it, for me, like almost this amazing European city that I'm able to, you know, which walk around in, but I'm in this place of I don't know, like bags of corpuscles and worrying about like my bloodstream, right? So you can get things out. I was I was feeling this very significantly and and I metaphored through through that level. Is it a text to image thing or what? I do every uh, my stuff is really odd. It's only part part of it is part of it isn't. Yeah. What's the other? I write my own code, as you know, and uh, uh, there's little tools. Some tool might be make the edges better. And you, you can imagine these things are, are, are um, potions. And I've written little potions over the years for different things. And when I think about what I'm doing, I just pour different potions and I spill them and I make a mess. And two hours later, I start in one place and I go to another. So I, I'm very much kind of journeying through the history of, of me. So if I'm an artist and I did something because I did it in code, similar to you, um, uh, I can save that and use that again. So much Reese's work with me and others, so much of like the, the potion is the name of the project that I was working on at the time. So I, I'm a little bit more buried in that way. Um, we've been here for a while. Any, any, other, any other questions? Maybe I'll just, uh, Well, no matter what, but just in case someone's thinking. So I just wanted to bring up ideation because I said it so quick. This is me in mid journey thinking, can you, can you ideate? Can I make sofas? I don't know the first thing about making sofas, but I'm gonna start making sofas. And you know, it's even more realistic. And then Kate Hennessy, so who you know, and I came up with this idea for a museum that in the museum is technology to save the world that never fully worked. Uh, and we decided, okay, we can't make a museum but maybe we'll make a graphic comic book of these things. So this is, I might even say it somewhere. I don't, I can't find it. Oh yeah, a politician talking. This is a, this is a vacuum that vacuums up the lies <laughs> of a politician that was made in the 30s, right? So, so I'm just, the, the, this is someone ideating something from the Met Gala, because they just watched it, but through paper folding. Um, and people are doing jewelry. I thought this was really good. This was someone trying to do a, an Escher logo. And on its own, it kind of goes, oh, well, I'll do the, maybe I can do the, the, the stairway as an example of that. 
I was slightly for research mainly, although, you know, you guys don't pay me enough, so it could be a side game as well. I was thinking about, oh, could I make, just as an, can I make design objects? That would, I'm in museums all the time, that would be in the design store of the museum, maybe clocks or teapots. And I was just there just making dozens of these just to see if, if there was something that made sense to do. So this is what I mean when I talk about ideation, like I made these clocks. And this is literally, you know, and you can say there's a problem here, but I surely put, I remember, I put a little influence of a particular artist in here um, who was a surreal artist, a Dada artist, which is a little bit odd like that. Um, but I like this one in the end. My thing is, this is good enough. I don't even have to, I could buy, brought it to a manufacturer and they go, oh, do you have, do you have, no, like, make it close to this. I don't care if it's exact. And, Cause I don't want to sit there and actually make the, make it fully. This is good enough where maybe we can just make it itself. So you can see I'm moving through that space. I, I did want to show you ideas when we're in the middle of coming back from COVID and someone realized, oh, do you go back to the office or not? And if you go back to the office, are you like, is it four of you there and the whole office is just empty? Or could, for the number of people in the room. And they they came up with this, it says uh, self-driving room partitions. So, so we tried all these. So this, but this one, you know, you can just keep varying it and saying what you don't like and what you do like. And I, there was more of them, but this is a great idea. It's, oh, okay. It's two of them on a right angle that you can change the right angle and the motor runs. So you could just, you could just make any, you can just divide the room anywhere. So it's not just doing visual design. It could be doing conceptual design too, right? Um, and, and onward. This is someone who just, I like dinosaurs and I got a lot of old socks. So I think I could come up with a, making socks, uh, dinosaurs from old socks. Why does it look the way it does? Because it said cinematic lighting. So it's getting that lighting from that, right? Uh, and I, I was doing it with, with uh, items and everything else. So these are really old. I have much new ones on the website if you want to see kind of the art that I'm kind of doing. I'm sure we do a lot more. Uh, um, uh, and Katie and I did a lot more with that, that, that book that they were saying, which you can, we had, we had blimps from the 1970s that, that come together and try and catch with the net that try and catch warheads coming in from Russia. Like if you just think of every possible thing and then try and build it, you're able to do it. So this is what I mean by the ideation. And this is the ideation you get with this big dome system. If you think about the meaning, you saw that I had a, 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 um, a study that we're doing in emotion space and redid it to fit that. And this is what I think that design companies and others will really start doing is, is, is thinking about what do we make? What's important about what we make? Can we label the history of everything made or thought about in that space with our thinking in it? So when we ideate, we ideate in kind of the IP or creative space of what we're doing. And then we'll all personally have that. So if you're thinking about what you're doing with chat GPT now, eventually you could put, and you could do this now, put in kind of all your papers, if you've written, written over a hundred, just dump all my papers in there. And then everything I've ever thought, maybe just keep the mic open for my rest of my life. And at some point, oh, that's kind of me. So I can say, oh, goodness gracious, another grad wants another reference letter. Can we write a reference letter for me? Um, by the way, I don't know if you've done it, but bullet pointing, so you make a bullet point of everything you want in a letter, and then you go back to the top and discursively say, this is the way I want you to bring all those things up. It, it does quite a significant job. They sometimes call this an AI whisperer. Someone, you, some people do this and it doesn't work. Some people kind of know how to talk to it. We don't tell in the prompt for Picasso, you're a Picasso, it doesn't do as well. If you can say, you're talking to Picasso, um, it does a lot better, uh, it turns out, because it doesn't get confused. Um, hallucination with these systems, a lot of times they go into third person. So you'd be going, hi, Picasso, how are you doing? And then it might just say, and Picasso walked away. So what are you doing there? And just, just to bring this back again to it's only as good as the training set. It's trained from 
is there a book or script in the world that is just is just he said she said he said no there's all even in 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 scripts that are pretty much as dialogue there still will be a, and then it walked to the back of the stage so you can see now this is what i'm saying this gravity pull to do something wrong this picasso one i was using is, is full of themselves kind of issues we did a van gogh one Van Gogh wrote 700 letters to his brother Theo, so we could put in a lot of Van Goghs. In fact, we have it wearing red if it's a if it's from Van Gogh. So we're getting almost 30 to 40 percent. It's 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 his very words, right? Um, so I'm chatting with him, and uh, uh, and sometimes I don't have a lot of time, so I purposely say, um, "What are you doing now?" And he'll say, "I'm painting my friend Van Gogh, uh, Gauguin." Which I have like in the prompt, so he will say more than that. Because he lived with uh, Gauguin, they had a fight. Gauguin ran back to France. He got pissed off, cut off his ear, and, and it's just a good drama to start. He says, "Oh, I'm big, you know, how's that going?" And then Picasso would just be like, "Well, when we lived together, he just kind of go." I said something stupid, and he left me. It's like, "Oh, okay." And he's you just realize that Van Gogh is just this this timid. Like, no one loves me, I, I, I'm sick. And, but if I just Protestant ethic, if I just kind of work hard, I can, and, and you just, I almost cry talking to Picasso because he's got that style. And then at one point I was uh, saying, well, you know, uh, then the ear thing. And I said, well, how did you get your ear to, to heal? I said, well, the monks use a half, a half, half moon swab of ointment. I said, did it help? It's like, no, I had to heal myself. So I, then I said, well, how did you heal spiritually given your friend? And you know what he said back? Given that he was right on, he said, well, I have a friend in Jesus. I was just like, why did he say that? And then you're realizing, of course, I said spiritual, I said friend. Of course, how many times is I have a friend in Jesus in every book and forum and crawl in the world? So that would be a hallucination if you think that wouldn't be the proper thing for him to have said. The pull of the way I said it is just too strong and it just went to the one million places that people said I have a friend and the songs and everything else. So when you're seeing these hallucinations, it's not always wrong. It's simply a pull in kind of different directions. Okay, we've been doing this for a while. I think I don't see any more questions. So um, hopefully you have a better sense of this. And again, these are real live systems and we're using them all over the place. Um, I have a undergraduate in the room who's doing directed studies. We're making a new character. And this new character is going to be an AI who explains, it debates AI to humans. And it's totally honest and totally nervous and totally worried about the world. And we're just so happy. We're just so hoping, like if it was on CNN and you have this person going, AI is great, it's wonderful. And then our bot kind of goes, uh, I'm an AI, I don't, I don't think so. It's like, well, you shouldn't worry about anything. It's like, oh, I'm not worried, but I'd be worried for you. And he would just actually do the opposite of the, because when it's, oh, that was a really good line. Is that what AIs think? You go, oh, AIs think, no, hold on, let me just do it. No, I stole that. That was a conglomeration of the talk by the really good person. And we just want to make this super honest AI character, because we think the notion of debating with someone who's thinking the other way it's just wonderful. And of course, it, it'll go viral. When it goes viral, then everybody can get on their phone and talk to this character. So those are the kinds of, of things that we're doing. And with virtual, it's nursing and education and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested, let me know. Okay, thanks, everybody.